Darkness at the break of noon, shadows even the silver spoon, the handmade blade, the child's balloon, eclipses both the sun and moon. Song lyrics by Bob Dylan. Where do these ideas come from? As someone who's been a professional artist for over 30 years, I wish I knew. Uh, where implies creativity has a location. Like, is it in your brain, in your mind, or elsewhere? In ancient times, it was believed that creativity was a spiritual entity and would uh, come down and uh, bestow itself upon special individuals. However, nowadays, we view creativity to be entirely contained within our own minds and bodies. However, neuroscience tells us that the brain of a creative person is not physically distinct from other brains. A leading neuroscientist, Dr. Nancy Andreessen, tells us that creative individuals have more neural activity in the associative cortices of the brain, particularly at times of rest. But she also tells us that much of what causes creativity remains a mystery. Thankfully, this talk won't delve into neuroscience. Uh, instead, it aims to open some of the doors to the mysteries of creative thinking and perhaps make it accessible to those of you who believe it's not within your grasp. So, if you need an idea, what is it that you do? Do you uh, lie down on the couch and close your eyes and search your mind, concentrating? trying to get the right alignment of thoughts as if you were trying to unlock the secret combination of a vault. And then you'd get the vault open and Eureka, there would be your idea. Well, if it's got to do with a combination in a vault, that's not the way to get a good idea. And I think, how about we scrap the vault and try another route? Um, have you ever considered the idea or ever considered that capturing a creative idea bears a closer resemblance to making friends with an invisible bird. It's out in your backyard someplace, and like any friendship, there's no formula as to how you get this to happen. So what do you do? Well, if you were lost at sea and there was no land in sight, what would you do? Okay, the ancient mariners would look at the position of the sun, moon, and stars and plot their direction. And as they traveled, they'd look at the changing color of the ocean or the presence of kelp beds or the direction birds were flying. And their experience taught them to trust those indicators and that at some point, land would appear. So do you have indicators that help you uh, realize if you're on course for a creative idea? Okay, well, let's try a couple of things. You're on the way to work and you're on the freeway and a uh, big throng of traffic in front of you and people are tailgating you and then two big trucks come up and pull up on both sides of you and box you in and you can't get out, you're trapped. Now, whether on the freeway or at your job or anywhere else, I think we can all agree that the feeling of being trapped and not being able to move is not conducive to creative thinking. So let's try something else. Let's say you get off the freeway and you decide on no destination and you decide on no time limits and you're just gonna drive a winding country road. What would happen? What would the difference be? You can now look in all directions. Wouldn't you start to notice things? And as you went along, wouldn't the number of observations build? Um, you might have random thoughts, that's okay. But it's also possible that one of your observations could trigger a vivid memory. And then that vivid memory might 
connect to your random thoughts, or the random thoughts can trigger another memory, or you, you, or co contradictory thought, or anything. It doesn't matter because you have no premeditated plan. You're just relaxed, enjoying your mind, making various associations and connections, an indicator you're on course. Now, at some point, you might feel a hint of emotion. And that could be an indicator that your, your thoughts are now building. And possibly, you're transitioning from a period of observation into a period of incubation. And you may not be able to put that something into words, but that's OK, because at least there's a something. And it's stirring. Now, the something might be small, but like a child, it can learn to be nurtured. It can learn to play with other thoughts and grow into a fine idea. And if there is uh, enough emotional truth around that idea, you'll likely feel compelled to pursue that idea. And it's at that point that the invisible bird may come and, and find you. And as you develop and nurture that idea, and you listen to the idea, and you let the idea be what it is, that invisible bird might like you enough to land on your finger. Now, Dr. Nancy Andreessen says that creative minds have an especially enriched repertoire of associations, an enhanced ability to see connections others cannot see. She uses Shakespeare as an example. Uh, a genius with a gigantic vocabulary. Now, just imagine the, the increased number of connections and associations that are enabled by that vocabulary. Well, it's no wonder he was as prolific a writer as he was. He invented new words for the English language and came up with enduring phrases like, love is blind and all that glitters is not gold. So, do more connective possibilities increase the chance for a novel idea? Could be. Now, most of you know or have heard about the idea of a vanishing point. And this idea of linear perspective as a way to depict pictorial space stood unchallenged for hundreds of years. Now this is a picture by renowned artist David Hockney. He went around his studio taking photographs of a desk from all different angles and from above. And then he took those individual photographs and assembled them into this image. And the image shows us the desk without the restriction of linear perspective. But it also shows us the desk without a single, singular, fixed point of view. In other words, you can see the desk from the side, from the top, from this way and that way, as if you were moving around it. Is that significant? Well, let's see. I was at my daughter's graduation some years ago, and I took a photograph of the ceremony. And I, f I felt it, it wasn't right, didn't do justice. And then I remembered something Hockney said. He said, are you in the world or are you separate from it? And I looked at the image and I thought, am I separate from the event? Is it like I'm looking at the event through a keyhole? So I got inspired and I shot photographs in all directions. And once those photographs were assembled, well, you, the viewer, are not looking at this event through a keyhole. You're now an active participant in the experience because you are free to explore my changing point of view 
as you are not separate from the experience, you are in it, unencumbered by linear perspective and the vanishing point. Hmm. Now, David Hockney says that the vanishing point and linear perspective developed during the Renaissance when the crucifixion was the primary subject in painting and art, and that the two things have something in common. When nailed to a cross, an individual cannot move and is in a fixed position. Similarly, in linear perspective, you, the viewer, are given but one point of view, frozen by linear perspective and the vanishing point. You're in a fixed position, too. Hockney has a, uh, an expression. A lack of movement is what kills. What does he mean by that? Is he telling us that we need to move in order to live? Is he saying we need to free ourselves from the cross of fixed beliefs? and come down and learn life's possibilities. And if we stay in that fixed position, it could be deadly. Now, Bob Dylan has another quote, another song lyric. He who is not busy being born is busy dying. And Picasso has a quote. Inspiration exists, but it must find you working. Is there a common thread there between those quotes? Aren't they all telling us that the wonders of life, the creativity and inspiration is really all around us? But you've got to get out of that fixed position. You've got to be active. You've got to be in motion and evolving in order to experience it. Now, there is hardly a modern painter or sculptor that doesn't owe Picasso a debt of gratitude. He, more than any other artist, is responsible for freeing the 20th century from the prison of linear perspective and the vanishing point. As a result, the 20th century opened to a flood of innovation, art movements that give us new ways of seeing, new ways of thinking. But are these concepts relevant to you? Well. Today, unlike past generations where a child might follow in the footsteps of the parent, now one generation struggles to understand or even speak to the next. Trucks are driving themselves. Real estort, real est, re, retail stores may be replaced by delivery drones. And then we have the earth-shaking development of AI and the massive reconfiguring of society to follow. As the pace of change accelerates, what is it that our technological advancements bring to us? Hope or anxiety and fear? Do we wish to put the genie of innovation back in the bottle? Is it time to dig in our heels? Would it be better if we pursued the fantasy of a bygone era? Should we build a barricade to keep change out or stay crucified to our immovable beliefs? Well, the inability to change can only bring us futility, stagnation, and our demise. So, imagine a society that could see a variety of points of view as an advantage rather than a weakness. Imagine if only we could trade the current political train wreck of fixed positions in for a place where ideas could be shared, nurtured, and allowed to evolve. Imagine the amount of connectivity and new ideas that would be possible. 
So, as we travel these uncharted waters, how valuable is your creativity? As with the ancient mariners, our course is determined by our way of thinking. Ideas are now our guiding sun, moon, and stars. And as we ready our course, let's trust in our creativity. We have a chance one day to see a better world where that invisible bird can come down and find us all. Thank you very much. <laughs>